Lesson number 168, Surah Al-Anbiya, ayah number 25 to 37. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Indeed, those people who have disbelieved. And who are they? Primarily the verse is referring to the people of Makkah. Because remember that Surah Al-Hajj, parts of it are Makki and also parts of it are Madani. So those people who disbelieve, وَيَصُدُّونَ And they also prevent, they also stop. Who? People. From what? عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ From the way of Allah. What is the way of Allah? His religion. What is the way of Allah? The way of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for His servants. The way that takes a person to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah's worship in the manner that Allah has prescribed. So there are some people who don't let others live in that way. Who don't let others go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To embark on a path that will lead them to Allah's pleasure. They stop them from the religion of Allah. And there are different ways of doing this. Like for example, the Muslims when they were in Makkah, was there sad on sabilillah? A lot. Too much. So much so that if any person came into Makkah from outside, a visitor, what would the mushrikeen do? They would go outside of Makkah, all right, and all the major routes that would lead into Makkah, they would stop the travelers and they would warn them, look, there is a man inside, his name is Muhammad, he's from the Banu Hashim, he's gone a little crazy, he is a madman, he's a poet, he's this, he's this, make sure you don't listen to him. So this was part of stopping people from the way of Allah. There was one such man whom they tried to stop that don't go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So he thought in his heart, you know, I'm a doctor. I'll go to him and I'll see if he's sick, I'll cure him. You know, I'll treat him. So he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Why? In order to help the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But what happened? He was helped. In fact, so he accepted Islam when he met the Prophet ﷺ. Anyway, this was a part of Sadr and Sabilillah. Likewise, they would stop the people who had embraced Islam, they would also stop them. So for example, Sa'adun Nabi Waqas anhu, a young boy, he was 16 or 17 years old when he embraced Islam. And what happened? His mother loved him dearly. And his mother said that if you don't leave Islam, I will not eat, I will not drink, I will not... You know, rest, nothing like that. So basically you'll see me dying. And I will die if you don't leave Islam. So Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, he was firm. And he said to his mother, Oh my mother, if you were to die in this way, many times, even then I will not leave Islam. So when the mother realized that Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas is firm on his religion, then basically she went and had something to eat. And then she was fine. But this was a way of stopping people from the way of Allah. Emotional blackmail. Some people also became very violent. They use violence in order to stop people from the way of Allah. So for instance, when it comes to Bilal radiallahu anhu, Khabbab radiallahu anhu, what happened to them? They were physically abused. They were tortured. Not just by people who own them, but their owners, what did they do? They handed them over to the youths that go and drag them in the streets of Makkah. And they abused Bilal radiallahu anhu, Khabab radiallahu anhu, the family of Yasir. I mean, this was common in Makkah. This was a way of stopping people from the way of Allah. Another way in which they stopped people from the way of Allah was false propaganda. Lies and rumors that they spread about the Prophet wasallam, about Islam, about the Qur'an, about the Muslims. So that people would get offended with the Muslims even before they came to know about Islam. They were upset with the Prophet ﷺ even before they heard the message of the Prophet ﷺ. They hated him even before they met him. False propaganda. This was also a way of stopping people from the way of Allah. And they adopted different ways. And these ways, they continue. They continue until today. And they will continue until the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those people who stop people from the way of Allah, and they also stop people from wal masjid al haram and the sacred mosque. What is the masjid al haram? The Kaaba and its surrounding area. So they stop people from that, meaning they stop people from going there and worshipping Allah. They don't let people worship Allah over there. And this was something very common in the Meccan era. Like for example, the Prophet ﷺ himself, when he would go into the haram, and he would perform the salah, he would go into sujood, 
people would get very angry. But nobody would say anything. Because they had some respect for the Prophet ﷺ. He was a Qurayshi after all. But one man, Abu Jahl, what would he do? He would go and insult the Prophet ﷺ. At one occasion, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, I've told you so many times, do not perform your prayer here. You're not welcome here. You're not allowed to perform your prayer here. And if you do that, I am going to do such and such and such. He threatened the Prophet ﷺ. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Kalla la tuti'hu. Never obey him. Do not obey him. Wasjud. And do sajda. Go and pray. So they stopped the Prophet ﷺ from performing the prayer even in the haram. When it comes to the recitation of the Qur'an, even that the Muslims were not allowed to do. You know at one occasion, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he went to recite Surah Al-Rahman publicly. He was one of the first people who recited the Qur'an openly. And when he did that, he could not even reach the end of the surah. Why? Because he was, he was assaulted. He was physically attacked. He couldn't complete the recitation. Now, think about this. The Masjid al-Haram, the Kaaba and its surrounding area, what is that? It's the house of Allah. It's the place where people go to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through prayer, through the recitation of the Qur'an, right? Through tawaf. But what happened? The Muslims were not allowed. They were not allowed. And Allah says that, Alladhi, this masjid is that which ja'alnahu, we have made it, linnasi for all people sawa, equal. Meaning, all people have equal right to it. And what does it mean by all people? Those who wish to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have equal right to it. But the people of Mecca, the Quraysh, the disbelievers amongst them, the mushrikun amongst them, what did they do? They treated the Kaaba as if it was their own property. They treated the Masjid al-Haram as if it was their own property. Because of which they would not let the Muslims come in. You understand what this is? You see, if it's your own house, right? If it's your house, and somebody wishes to come inside and have a party, what would you say to them? Get out of here, this is not your house. Right? I'm gonna call the police on you. You're not allowed to do this in my own house. You can go do this elsewhere, but you're not welcome here. If it's your house, you can do that. Correct? But if it's a public place, can you do that? You can't do that. And if you try to do that, that's not fair. When it comes to Masjid al-Haram, remember, it does not belong to any human being. When it comes to the Kaaba, it is not owned by any human being, any tribe, any nation. No. People have equal right to it. Which people? People who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to the mushrikun, we know that now, mushrikun are not allowed over there. Why? Because that place is pure, with tawheed. And if the mushrikun are allowed to enter over there, what will happen? Shirk will prevail. Shirk will spread. So it's the center of tawheed. So anyway, الَّذِي جَعَلْنَاهُ لِلنَّاسِ سَوَاء الْعَاكِفُ فِيهِ الْعَاكِفْ عَيْن كَافَّ عُكُوف is to remain somewhere, to reside somewhere. And عَاكِفُ فِيهِ it's referring to the residents of Makkah. Those who reside in Makkah. وَالْبَاد الْبَاد Bad is from بَاد الْوَاو Badu. What is Badu? Desert. Bad is a desert dweller. Alright? A Bedouin in other words. And Bedouins, they were considered visitors in cities because they would come visit the cities and then go return to the desert. Alright? So the point that is being made over here is that whether someone lives in Mecca or is a visitor in Mecca, whether he is a resident of Mecca or he is an outsider, when he comes to Masjid al-Haram, he has a haqq to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over there. But what happened? When the Muslims migrated to Medina in order to save their lives, and they intended to go perform their umrah, what happened? Did the mushrikeen let them in? They didn't. They didn't. They raised their weapons in fact, that if you dare to come, we will fight you. We will not let you inside Makkah. So what happened then? The treaty of Hudaybiyah occurred. And then the following year, the Muslims were allowed to come in in order to perform umrah. So this way of the mushrikun is being criticized. That who do you think you are? Just because you live in Mecca, you think you have the right over the haram? No, you don't. This haram, this masjid al-haram, it is for who? It is for people who wish to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ يُرِدْ And whoever intends, فِيهِ in it, meaning in the haram, in masjid al-haram, 
Whoever intends therein, bi ilhadin, ilhad. What is ilhad? Deviation. Bi zulmin through zulm through oppression. Nuzikhu min adabin alim. We will make him taste the painful punishment. What is this referring to? Ilhad. What is ilhad? Deviation. Lahd. Lahd is basically a grave that goes sideways. It's an L-shaped grave. Alright? Meaning it's not that a hole has been dug and a person has been put in that hole and then covered from top. No. A hole has been dug and then it's dug sideways. And then the body is placed over there. And then that hole is covered. So anyway, this is lahad. That you're going straight and then you move to a side. You deviate. You understand ilhad? Now ilhad means udul anil qasd. To move from the right course. There is a proper way of doing things. There is a right way of doing things. To move away from that, that is ilhad. So deviation. Misguidance. This is ilhad. So ilhad, what does it mean over here? Deviation in religion. What is the right way? Tawheed, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What would be ilhad in that? What would be deviation when it comes to tawheed? Shirk, associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand? Makkah is a place that is sacred. Right? What does it mean? Bloodshed is not allowed. Fighting is not allowed. So if a person causes bloodshed in Makkah, if a person hurts others, physically assaults others, then what is that? What is that? Ilhad. It is deviation. Because what is the proper thing to do in Makkah? Human life is sacred. People's property is sacred. What would be ilhad in that? That people's lives are not safe, their property is not safe, they're being assaulted, they're being abused. This is all different forms of ilhad. Alright? And ilhad bi zulm. What kind of deviation is this? Through zulm, meaning oppressing others, wronging others. First of all, wronging zulm against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is that shirk? Because in the shirk, la zulmun azim, it's the greatest zulm. And then on the creation, Hurting them. So whoever does anything like that, what is the consequence? Allah says, نُذِقْهُ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ We will make him taste painful punishment. If the intention for such an act is not tolerated, because notice, وَمَنْ يُرِدْ He intends. For the one who intends is painful punishment, then what do you think about the person who actually does ilhad in the haram? Now what do we see in this ayah? That the haram is a place that has been made sacred by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's secure, it is safe, where human life is safe, even trees are safe, rocks are safe. I mean, nothing should be hurt, harmed over there. Why? So that people may worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in peace. Because when you fear for your life, when you fear for your property, can you pray in peace? Can you? No. What happens many times? We're going to the masjid, but throughout our salah, what are we thinking about? Our bag. And where is our bag? Just in front of us. But still we're scared. Somebody's gonna pick it up and run away with it. What are we worried about? Our shoes. Isn't it? What are we worried about? Our car in the parking lot. Somebody's gonna hit it and run away. You understand? You cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly if you're not at peace. If you don't feel secure. So the rest of the world, yes, there's always some risks and threats. Right? But when it comes to Makkah, when it comes to Haram, when people go for Umrah, when people go for Hajj, security must be guaranteed. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that place safe and secure. Haram, Amin. And anyone who tries to disturb that peace, alright? How? By hurting people, by killing them, by theft or anything like that, then what does that bring him? Punishment. Look at Abraha. What happened to him? He tried to destroy the Kaaba with his whole army. What happened to his army? Did they survive? No. They were destroyed completely. And this matter is so serious that even carrying weapons in the haram is not allowed. You know that? Carrying weapons openly in the haram is something that is not allowed unless there is a serious you know, risk of danger. And for the purpose of protection, weapons are raised. But other than that, in general, it's not allowed. There is a chapter in Bukhari, in Sahih Bukhari, 
the chapter of Eid prayers. And in that is a section in which Imam Bukhari writes, مَا يُكْرَهُ مِنْ حَمْلِ السِّلَاحِ فِي الْعِيدِ وَالْحَرَمِ That it is disliked to carry weapons during Eid, meaning when it is Eid day, and also in the Haram. It's not allowed to do that. It is disliked. And under that chapter, Imam Bukhari records a hadith in which we learn that at one occasion, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he was attacked. All right, He was attacked by someone with a spear and basically the man, he attacked him at his foot because that's all he could do. So the spearhead went into the sole of his foot, making his foot stick into the stirrup. So basically, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was badly injured. Now, who was this person who did it? He was a khariji basically, a person who had revolted against the, against the khilafah. And such people, they considered the companions of the Prophet ﷺ to be apostates. So they were attacking the companions. So this is the reason why this man attacked Ibn Umar ﷺ. Now what happened that Hajjaj, you know Hajjaj? Hajjaj bin Yusuf, he's the one who attacked the Kaaba. Alright, he was a Muslim. And he brought Muslims under him to attack the Kaaba. So much so that the walls of the Kaaba were destroyed. And he was also fighting the companions. Long story, we're not going to go into it. But anyway, Hajjad bin Yusuf, when he heard that Ibn Umar had been attacked, he went to see Ibn Umar. And he said, if only you would tell me who did this to you, I would punish him severely. You know what Ibn Umar anhu said? He said, you did it to me. Because you are the one who started this. You are the one who allowed weapons to be raised in the haram. You are the one who allowed that battles be fought in the haram. You started this. You are responsible. So you understand? The haram is so sacred that you cannot even raise weapons over there. Forget about bloodshed. Forget about Killing people. You can't even raise weapons. Even animals are safe. So safe that you cannot even chase an animal so that it goes outside of the haram so that you can attack it. No, you can't even do that. If a killer, if a murderer, if a criminal is found in the haram, even he will not be attacked. Even he will be spared until he leaves the haram. Then he is in danger. So anyway, the haram has been made sacred by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anyone who violates its sanctity, then what is for him? Painful punishment. And this is the reason why we see that a person who violates the sanctity of the haram, then he is punished in the haram. You understand that? Generally human life is safe in haram. But someone who causes bloodshed or does any form of ilhad in the haram, by the Kaaba, near the Kaaba, in Makkah, then where will he be punished? In Makkah, near the Kaaba. Why? Because he violated the sanctity of the Haram, now his sanctity will be violated. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, he was asked, that is there ever a time when a sin is recorded, multiplied, like for example, good deed, when it's recorded, how much reward is given to it? Ten times, right? So is there ever a possibility that a sin would be multiplied? He said no. Unless that sin was committed in Makkah. If a sin is committed in Makkah, then what happens? The sin is multiplied. Why? Because it's against the sanctity of the haram. Once I went for Umrah, alright, and um, after Salah I was returning to the hotel, and I was with my family, but you know, in that whole rush, what happens is that you lose everybody. So I lost everybody. So I was making my way back to the hotel, and as I'm going, I'm entering into the hotel, the main doors, and what happens is that I could hear alarm, and so many people just stormed out of the doors. All right, And I just stood on the side, because so many men, 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 everywhere, everywhere. So I just stood on the side, scared, what's happening over here? And I saw the most scariest thing ever. And what was that? That a big circle was formed, and this happened within five minutes. A big circle was formed, hundreds of men, hundreds of men literally, and a boy was brought, a youth was brought in the middle, and he was lashed. He was lashed. And I was just like, what's going on? What's happening here? It was the scariest thing I've ever seen. And when I went inside, you know, I asked around, so... 
somebody told me that that boy had been caught harassing a girl harassing a girl in the mall so he was caught harassing a girl in the mall he was taken outside lashed in public and sent you see he harassed a girl he was harassed even he was not safe in the haram generally in the haram you can't even strike a bird you can't even strike a child you can't even strike any person but the person who hurts others in the haram then he loses all respect he doesn't deserve any any protection his protection is taken away and this is a very serious matter wa may yurid fihi bi ilhad nudhiqhu min adhabin alim there is painful punishment for him in the haram wa id bawana li ibrahim and mention when we designated for ibrahim alayhi salam bawana bawa yubawi'u ba waw hamza what does it mean to appoint and prepare a suitable place so think of it like this you go for camping somewhere forget about camping you go for a picnic somewhere now inshallah the weather will be nice so you go to a park when you go there what's the first thing you do before you take things out of your car what's the first thing you do find a spot where are we going to sit right and what kind of a place do you choose for yourself just any random place what kind of place that which is most suitable you have shade you're closer to the parking lot you're closer to the bathrooms right so you want that it should be perfect in every way so this is bawwa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he appointed the place he designated the place which place makana the place of al bait the house which house the house of allah the kaaba meaning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed the place designated the place he told ibrahim alayhi salam this is where you have to build the kaaba it wasn't that ibrahim alayhi salam was traveling and in the middle of nowhere he thought okay i'll leave hajar and ismail over here and then when he came back one day he had just had an idea that okay we'll build the kaaba here and since this place looks good we'll build it here no it wasn't random it wasn't up to ibrahim alayhi salam to decide who decided that kaaba should be in makka in the hijaz in that barren valley Who decided? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided. وَإِذْ بَوَّأْنَا لِإِبْرَاهِيمَ مَكَانَ الْبَيْتِ And then Ibrahim alayhi salam constructed the Kaaba. With who? With his son Ismail. And when they built it, what happened? أَلَّا تُشْرِكْ بِي شَيْئًا Ibrahim alayhi salam was taught, do not associate with me anything. This matter was clarified, that no shirk must be done with Allah. وَطَّهِرْ بَيْتِي And Purify, clean my house. لِلْطَائِفِينَ For those who do tawaf, who go around the Kaaba. وَالْقَائِمِينَ And those who stand, meaning who stand in prayer, in qiyam. Or qa'im can also be understood as muqim, one who resides, one who remains in the haram for the purpose of i'tikaf. وَالْرُكَّعْ Plural of rakir, the one who's doing rukur. وَالْرُكَّعْ As-sujood, as-sujood, plural of sajid, the one who's doing sajda. Clean my house for these people. For these people who will come to worship Allah over here. What do we see in this ayah? That the house of Allah was constructed at whose command? Allah's command. It was not Ibrahim alayhi salam's decision, nor was it built by accident. Allah designated its place, that it should be in a barren valley, in the middle of nowhere. Allah decided this. Why? What does this teach us? What does it show to us? that a barren valley where nothing grows you put a seed it will dry out nothing will grow there however you'll find iman over there your iman will grow when you go there when it comes to dunya nothing grows there in the sense that you don't go there seeking dunya you don't go there seeking material benefits you go there seeking growth in iman allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cause anything to happen it seems like a barren valley in the middle of nowhere who will go there who will go and worship allah there it will be so difficult but do people go oh yeah they go you would think it's so hot in the summers nobody would want to go there but it's in the summer that people like to go there right it's amazing the cold even is very very severe but still people go there even when the kaaba is flooded do people go yes 
Will that stop them from tawaf? No. They will swim around the Kaaba doing tawaf. Whether there is construction going on or, or doesn't matter what's going on. What, will people go there? Yes, they will. It's a miracle. The Kaaba is a miracle because it is in the middle of nowhere, literally. If you look at the area of Hijaz, if you learn about the history of the Arabs, what you find is that Arabia was populated in the south, in the north, and a few tribes here or there. When it comes to Mecca and its surrounding areas, there was nothing. Nobody lived there. And what happened? When Hajar and Ismail, when they were in Mecca and the well of Zamzam was there, what happened? There were some nomadic tribes, right? Like for example, the tribe of Jurhum specifically, who had left Yemen, the south of Arabia, in search of a better place. Because when there was a flood, the whole area was destroyed. So all the tribes, they dispersed in Hijaz. So how Jurhum came and settled in Mecca, and how life began over there is amazing. Because nothing grows there. There's no wheat. Nothing. There's no food. People would go from Mecca elsewhere to buy food. If you want clothes, you have to go outside of Mecca. You want even construction material, you have to go outside of Mecca. Remember how the Kaaba was built? I told you the story. Where the materials came from. Right? Nothing is in Mecca. But when it comes to Iman, where do you find that? In Mecca. When you want forgiveness, where do you want to go? To Mecca. When you want a dua to be accepted, when you want a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where do you go? To the barren valley where nothing grows. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing. That how a person, you know, for instance, a couple, they're trying to have a child. Desperately, they're told, go for Umrah. They go for Umrah. They go for Hajj. And what happens? They go to the barren valley where nothing grows, but they come back, and what do they get? A child. So if you think about it, the Kaaba is truly a miracle. The city of Mecca is a miracle. Masjid al-Haram is a miracle. It's amazing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that the Kaaba should be over there so that people witness this miracle. They see this miracle. And it was made clear after the Kaaba was constructed that Ibrahim a.s. was guided that there must be no shirk over here. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be worshipped. And one more thing that Ibrahim a.s. was told was, Tahir bayti, clean my house. Keep the karba clean. Clean it and keep it clean. Keep it clean from what? Tangible filth and intangible filth. Physical filth and spiritual filth. What is physical filth? There's many types of it. Right? And when it comes to spiritual filth, what is that? Shirk. So keep the karba clean of that. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 125 also we learn, وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ أَن طَهِرَ بَيْتِي لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالْرُكَّعِ السُّجُودِ Keep clean the house for the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see that cleanliness is a major part of our religion. A major part of our deen. Without cleanliness, there is no concept of ibadah. Ibadah is not valid if person is not clean. If there is an ajasa on the body, if a person does not have wudu, and he knows, he's aware, and he still prays, is that prayer valid? No. What will it bring instead? Punishment, as we learned. So we see that cleanliness is a very, very important part of our deen. Both kinds of cleanliness, hissi and marnawi, physical as well as intangible. When it comes to physical cleanliness, how important it is that we must remove filth from our body. Whether it is in the form of unwanted hair, or it is in the form of dirt, it is in the form of some kind of body excretion, body odor, whatever it may be, remove it from every part of the body, from the mouth to the eyes. Imagine when you're doing wudu, you clean your nose. You're made to clean your nose five times a day, blow your nose five times a day, rinse it out. I mean, deen is about cleanliness. We must be clean physically, cleaning the entire body. The head also, wipe the head in wudu, wash the feet, and then remove unwanted hair from the body. No matter where they are, under the arms, somewhere else, remove it. Do wudu, do ghusl. And once a week, a bath is mandatory. You know that? On every Muslim. Once a week bath is mandatory. It is wajib. It is haq that they must take a bath at least once a week. 
more than that good but if you don't then once a week is minimum requirement it's a part of deen and what we see over here is cleaning the masjid cleaning baitullah and this is also a very noble act and dirtying the masjid what kind of an act is it a noble act it's the exact opposite the exact opposite we see that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded his servants his khalil ibrahim alayhi salam to do what to clean the house Allah commanded His prophets, Ibrahim, Ismail, to clean the Kaaba, to keep Baytullah clean. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ also, what did he do at one occasion? When he found sputum, phlegm, dry phlegm on the wall, what did he do? He scraped it off. A woman who used to clean the masjid when she died, and the Prophet ﷺ was not informed, she was buried, the Prophet ﷺ went to her grave and prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive her. Cleaning the masjid is a very noble act. Dirtying the masjid, not acceptable. In Bukhari, again in Kitab salah there is a chapter that says, Bab kafaratil buzaqi fil masjid. The expiation for spitting in the masjid. Imagine, spitting in the masjid is not acceptable. And if a person does that, then he must give kafara. And what is that kafara? Pick up that spit, clean it off. It's not okay to leave your filth in the masjid. It's not acceptable. And you must pay kafara by cleaning it, by making that place as it was before. And there's a very interesting incident about Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah radiallahu anhu, in which we learn that at one occasion he was praying the salah and he had to spit. Alright, and it happens. You cough, there's phlegm in your mouth, what do you do? You can't swallow it, you have to let it out. So he had to spit it. And there is an etiquette of doing that, which is that a person must, you know, do it in a cloth. Or, so for example, a handkerchief or something. And if that is not possible, then uh, where a person is standing, then under the left foot. But after that, doesn't mean that you leave it there. No, you must clean it. And remember that the masjid at that time, the floor was pebbles, right? Or sand. It wasn't carpet. So it was okay for them to do that. So anyway, he did it. And he went home. It was night. He went home and he remembered that he had spat in the masjid and he was not able to pick it up or cover it up with the sand. And it was night time. He took flame of fire so that he could find his way into the masjid. And then he went to the masjid. He found that phlegm that he had spat and he covered it up or he got rid of it. And he said, Alhamdulillah, that I was saved from committing a sin in this night. The sahaba considered Spitting in the masjid, dirtying the masjid, what? A sin. Then is it okay that we leave our garbage in the masjid? But it's amazing how we come into the masjid and we throw shoes everywhere. One shoe is on the shelf and one shoe is somewhere else. It's in the way. What is this? Garbage is left outside of the masjid. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, somebody will come and pick it up. Yeah, we don't need this table. I don't need this stroller anymore. I don't need this car seat anymore. Let me leave it outside the masjid. And let the masjid pay to get rid of that garbage. You know, it's amazing how people will dump things over here. And we have to call people. We have to pay them to pick up the garbage. You know that? Al-Huda has to pay weekly for the garbage to be picked up. And the more garbage there is, the more we have to pay. So think twice before you leave anything here. Go ahead. Pay attention in small thing when you go into the masjid. He said when he go into the masjid, he saw one man he playing with a spare a beard, and whenever he doing so, he playing like that, so the hairs will be falling down, and it will be in the masjid. So he was annoying so much, but he cannot do anything. He said when the man left the masjid. And everybody left the message. He was with the same spot and looking for every single hair and he will take it himself and will throw it outside of the message. So now yes. when I see that I was amazed. I said we are as a woman think about how many our hair is yes. in the message. We just ignoring. We just it, it's it. amazing. Forget about hair. It's amazing how people will chew their nails and spit them out. Sitting inside the masjid. Is this acceptable? Or cleaning our ear as we're thinking. And taking earwax out and throwing that somewhere in the masjid. This is not acceptable. But unfortunately we have these bad habits. Wherever we go, we leave our filth behind. But the house of Allah does not deserve our filth. Yes, our socks are dirty. They're smelly. 
Yes, go ahead. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum. I was thinking, you know, what's the things make us, how we can think about the masjid is, um, the things make us to clean the masjid is, uh, for me, I think about it. If I want my house is clean, this is Allah's house. My house is nothing. I will leave it and go, but this is Allah's house. People will come and worship in it again and again. If I clean Allah's house, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us house in Jannah. Inshallah. You see, we claim to love Allah more than we love ourselves. Don't we? Then why is it that we love to clean our house and make sure that it stays clean, but when it comes to the house of Allah, we don't care about its cleanliness? Would you ever like it that as guests come into your house, the front foyer is just full of shoes, so that people have nowhere to step? People fall over? We don't like it in our house. When there is a gathering or something like that, a party, and people have to leave their shoes, how nicely they are put on the side. But when it comes to the masjid, it's amazing how we will just throw them right, left, and center. Everything of them, they wash them, yes. toilet paper, everything. But we think because it's uh, Allah's house, it's free, it's okay, we can do anything. Mm-hmm. But when you left them, wallahi, if someone is coming after you, you will be feel like a shame you are, see yourself as a Muslim. Mm-hmm. So if we, we start a little bit, not just because I'm cleaning, okay, uh, if someone else see me. Just I'm cleaning, I'm picking that in an in intention, I will Allah will give me reward for it. This is more than whatever you're doing, maybe spending all the night for tajot, praying, fasting, whatever, but this small deed will be accepted inside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, think about it, when we eat lunch over here, for example, how, how is it that we leave the tables? Are you allowed to leave the table like that at home? Leave your food there, leave your box there, leave your dishes on the table, leave the crumbs on the table, on the floor. What do you do? Do you clean up after yourself? You should, if you don't. Right? And if somebody doesn't clean up after themselves, how annoying that is at home. A friend of mine always tells me, she says, you want good health, come, come, let's go clean the masjid. This is her thing, like, if you want to have good health, keep your masjid clean. 